Today on the show, we're answering your questions. Questions like, how do I take better photos at my church when people look miserable? Or does each church ministry need its own brand and logo, or should it be linked in some way? We'll also discuss our recent episode with Elevation Church and all of the online discourse that was stirred up because of it and our feelings on all of this. This is the April 2024 Mailbag. Let's dive in. Well, hey there, and welcome to the Pro Church Tools Show. We're here to help you and your church navigate the biggest communication shift in 500 years. I'm Brady Shearer, your host. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host. We call him Bishop Buttery, because the Orzo recipe he sent me this week was far too fattening and threatened my lifespan. It is Alexander Mills. Hello, hello. And today, it's everyone's favorite episode. Bro, Church Tools, we're opening the mailbag. We're answering your questions. If you want your question answered on a future episode of the show, you can just put it in the comments below this YouTube video Mm -hmm. if you want to keep it private. Send us an email. Hello at ProChurchTools.com. Bishop Buttery, take us away with the first question. You've heard of a blue zone, much like your uh, lovely blue sweater today. They are these zones in yes. the planet where oh, people yeah, live forever. Yeah, don't, I don't want to, I'm not trying to hear this today. So, no, I'm just saying there's <laughs> one in Italy where, I watched a documentary on it, where these fellows are just eating pasta, uh, consuming lots of butter, surely olive oil, and drinking wine every day. And they live forever. So listen, you're offended by my general butter and olive oil consumption. And I don't drink a lot of wine, but I say this often. I could have a glass of wine with dinner every night. Maybe if I did, I'd live forever. So let me know when you make that recipe, though. I told you, do it just for me. Please, just once. It's not going to kill you. It had like 5x the butter for the orzo. Yes, yes. It was mush. Yes. It's so good. I'm I'm not confident that it's bad. Like I'm sure it's it's so good. (laughs) Well, we'll we'll save the rest of this conversation for uh, off air. We can argue about Orzo first. Let's get to uh, the questions. This one's about social media. Hey, we're part of a social media team at a church of about seven hundred people. Our senior pastor loves reels, and so do we. But he wants us to post four reels of the sermon per week. Do you find that if we post uh, that much, things will get lost because people won't interact with those things, or do you find that to be a helpful tactic in flooding the space with content? Okay, let's demystify a few of the misconceptions in the final sentence of that question. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as posting too much if the content is good. Okay. And this is the problem with every creator on social media is that we are all our own arbiter of if this content is good I was just going to say that. What's the metric of if the content is good? Because surely most, if not all churches, think like, yeah, this is great content. How are we supposed to know? So whatever you think is good, a good rule of thumb is to challenge yourself to make it 20% better. Mm. So that way you're kind of like recognizing your own fallibility. Sure. Like, hey, I, I probably think too much of what I've made, mm-hmm. so I'm gonna expect that it needs to be 20% better for it to qualify as good. And that usually helps rein in overall output. Um, there's no such thing as flooding the space with content either. The social algorithms are not so simple that you can game them by like publishing four times mm-hmm. a day and they're like, I don't know what we're gonna do with this. Might as well make it go viral. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, that's not how it's gonna work. Yeah. In the discovery era of social, your content will find the right audience. Mm-hmm. And this is what is different from the previous era. Let's say you had 300 followers as a church on social media. R- really, you could only reach those 300 people, save for a small bump, save for a really unusual viral post, like likely no church has ever experienced mm-hmm. that's listening save for the people in your church actively sharing it with their uh, social sphere. Nowadays, really, anyone on earth is a potential person that your content can reach. And so if you create something good, the discovery algorithm's job is to find the people that will resonate with that content. Mm -hmm. Of course, a big share of that is going to be people that already follow your account, but folks that are not following are also gonna be part of that potential share. In terms of practically, we try to get two reels per sermon. Okay. I have found for most uh, pastors and perhaps this uh, preaching team is incredibly, incredibly skilled and and pulling four clips uh, is something that's going to be successful. In my experience, working with many, many hundreds and thousands of sermons, two is almost always doable. Mm -hmm. When you start to reach beyond that, it becomes less likely. And so if you go into it thinking, I'm going to find four posts, what tends to happen is the quality is diluted. Okay. So Look for two. Now, if your pastor comes to you and says, we want to post four things per week from the sermon, uh, okay, how about instead of four reels, we go two reels, one carousel, one quote. Okay. This is doable with pretty much every sermon. Mm -hmm. This is the approach that we take at social sermons. 
Uh, if you're on the complete plan, you get two reels, one carousel, one quote per week, all from the same sermon. The quote, obviously, is going to be like a single line. Mm -hmm. And so that's not too difficult to find in the context of a 20, 30, 40 minute message. And then the way that we do the carousel is we'll find a similar length 30 seconds to 90 seconds, same thing we would do for a sermon clip that's video, vertical mm -hmm. video, reels, and then we transcribe it, and then we rewrite it from scratch for a carousel, but we use that idea as yeah. the source material. Yeah. And the reason we have to rewrite it is because the transcription is not going to translate for a compelling carousel, mm -hmm. but the idea is usually there. So now you have like two 30 to 90 second clips that like on their own, with some editing, moving around of creative ideas, cutting, cut out, are great. And then you have like a really good idea that maybe wasn't perfectly articulated, but you can polish it up, use the yeah. source material, improve the prose, and now it's ready for carousel. And yeah. then a quote, which is just a one-liner. Hopefully that would satisfy the appetite of the pastor that still wants four posts per week from the sermon. The other benefit of this is now you're hitting a variety of creative formats. You got the vertical video, you got a carousel, you got a quote, so it's not just the exact same type of content over and over again. Sure, and you've mentioned, we've talked about on recent episodes about how carousels are working right now, and not just working with your audience, but they're working in the discovery world, wherein when you have a strong carousel with that, that first screen, where it's like uh, three ways Jesus taught us how to pray, which is from your sermon last week, um, and you get people interacting with that post, Instagram is pushing that out into the discovery world in the same way they are with reels and short form videos. And so we're seeing with carousels, well executed carousels, um, really impressive reach as well, not just reaching your, your local audience, your follower count, but reaching you know, the, the infinite array of people that are, that are on Instagram nowadays. And so you give, you give yourself a chance with another piece of content or another style of content mm -hmm. that is proven to be working right now. Um, and, you know, speaking of algorithms, posting four sermon reels a week, and especially if it's not, if it's not resonating with your followers or with the algorithm, I guess in my estimation, I, I, I would say that that's doing that four times a week is actually giving the algorithm information that like, uh, people aren't resonating with this type of content. So Great when you point. do post one, even if it's really good, or if, even if it's your best, the algorithm has this information knowing that oh, people, they post these four times a week and, and they're not getting a lot of shares or people aren't really engaging with these. So you could be hurting yourself. And so some diversity of post types could really help give you a boost in that, that signal. Excellent point. Nothing to add. Next question. Oh, we're just getting right into it here. Well, no, we had a first question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Brady. Are you going to do any posting on the whole reaction to your episode with Elevation's copywriter? Okay, so let's uh, summarize what happened. A couple weeks ago on this very podcast, mm -hmm. we had Nikki Shearer of Elevation Church on the show, had a delightful one-hour-ish conversation with her. Uh, Nikki oversees all the language uh, and copywriting at Elevation. Mm -hmm. uh, no relation between us, which... <laughs> What are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances? But her last name does get mispronounced in the same way that yours does. <laughs> Absolutely, it does. Uh, so this episode went live and our audience enjoyed it. I then do what I've been doing with all interview episodes where I rewatch it and I take notes on what I think are like standout pieces and then I create reels and carousels from them. Y'all, this is the same strategy we're talking about <laughs> for <laughs> like, this. Is, the cards are being played. This is the same strategy we're yeah. talking about for your sermons. You make a big piece of content, it's good. You take out the highlights, repost them. So I did a reel on the impossible interview question that Elevation asks and people like that. I did one on why Elevation doesn't do hashtag pray for blank posts anymore. A couple more in the can <laughs> that uh, we just put in the uh, expiration basket, yeah. put in the trash. Uh, and then I created a newsletter, sent it out to 50,000 churches with the title, why Elevation won't use the word resurrection on their Easter invites, and got 100% uh, positive emails in reply. I made that into a carousel, published it on Instagram with the identical verbatim uh, copy. Big mistake. And 95% of our audience really enjoyed it. It was as I expected, kind of similar to the Mike Todd content. Um, some people didn't care for the approach. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that is informed by people's kind of preconceived notions exactly. or feelings about elevation that are unrelated to that specific yep. tactic. Yep. Uh, but it was 95% confident, 95% uh, con uh, Complimentary. That's the word. <laughs> and so uh, things were fine. Uh, Nikki reached out to me and she said, hey, yeah, I was kind of expecting some of that um, feedback. And, you know, she was complimentary of what 
we did with our copy, she was like, you know, we've worked with a lot of people. You did just did an excellent job of like articulating what I said and defending it and not at all presenting it in a way that was mm -hmm. untrue, unflattering, or purposefully misaligned in sure. a way. And that was about it until it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what happened was the content hit a secondary audience. And the reason this happened is because we've entered into a new era of pro church tools where our reach is far enough that if we have a post do well with our own audience, it trickles out to like the greater church mm -hmm. field. And never before has our content really mattered in that way mm -hmm. because we talk about digital and websites and communications and most mm -hmm. people just don't care. Mm -hmm. Because this piece of content was related to a church that everyone has... It, is anyone dispassionate about elevation? Right. You, yeah. I'm thinking no. You have a stance on them one way or another. Uh, yeah. So this got picked up. Um, it first started on TikTok. I published the carousel to TikTok. Uh, TikTok, we have 100,000 followers, and we get like a fraction of the engagement on TikTok relative to Instagram with the same amount of followers. Mm -hmm. So people uh, started picking it up. And uh, the first thing that happened was disclaimers were ignored. <laughs> so this was a 10-slide carousel. I dedicated an entire slide to basically pausing during my articulation of the tactic we were describing mm -hmm. to say, hey, just so you know, just so you know, what we're describing is exclusive to Easter invites. Mm -hmm. And within service and within the context of even, you know, as, as you can see on Elevation's social account, which is for their followers, mm -hmm. which is for people that mostly are knowing Jesus, they have no problem using the words like resurrection, blood of Jesus, Calvary. Um, that disclaimer was ignored, but I knew that would happen. So what I did sure. was I also put it in the caption and as a pinned comment. Ignored. Ignored. <laughs> and what happened was the secondary audience through a game of broken telephone mm -hmm. misinterpreted it as one, not me talking about an interview, but Elevation uh, submitting a press release. Yeah, that was strange. Yeah. And then them saying Elevation, for the purposes of not treating people as outsiders, will no longer be using the words resurrection, Calvary, or blood of Jesus. Full stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is categorically untrue, sure. unfortunately. Sure. And this is really um, I think a good example of the decades old saying, you know, a lie will get halfway around the world mm. before the truth can put on its shoes. Yeah. And social media, of course, exaggerates uh, that possibility. Relevant, as an example, of whom I have worn their shirts yeah. from back in the day at Kingdom Bound. It was surreal, man, to see, like, to see the name of our show in publication at Relevant. It was a little bit disorienting for me because, like, I'm not Brady Shearer. I'm sitting across the table from Brady Shearer. And to be clear, I am not Elevation Church. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. Um, but yeah, to, I, I was away on vacation when this is all unfolding, and I'm also not on TikTok, so I missed the first wave oh, of the drama. Okay. Well, and you can't duet a carousel. Right, so people So are, I wasn't getting tagged in any <laughs> right. of this. And then I'm like scrolling through my feet, ooh, Orzo, Orzo, oh, that's a normal amount of butter, Orzo, Brady <laughs> Shear. I was like, whoa! <laughs> that's me. Yeah, it was a little bit like uh, bewildering to see our names uh, published in Relevant Magazine, but sure enough, they're talking about it too. So Rele Re uh, Relevant said this, quote, in the article they wrote up, which was not an article, it was just aggregation. Yeah. Quote, Elevation has not responded to the controversy, although Pro Church Tools has attempted to come to the church's defense in a blog post, clarifying that Elevation does not use this language um, in invitations only. Did I copy that? Is that what they said? Clarifying that Elevation uses this language in invitations only. Let's mm -hmm. assume I mm -hmm. copied that wrong. Yeah. I didn't come to their defense. That was the source material. Yeah, that was it. I didn't write so, a blog post in response to this. It's like, no, that was, yeah. that was the material. This has been a really uh, fascinating like, case study of just seeing how like there's this runaway train mm. that is wrong. Like there were disagreements in the original comment section. Um, and I, th I said to a couple of people, and we'll get to those main disagreements and talk about how we responded to them. Um, but I said in a couple of those disagreements, they would start off by saying like, you are abusing scripture. Mm. And we'd get to the point where the person originally commented said, I would not take this approach. To which I said, that's great. Yep. Like, no I problems. wouldn't expect you to take every approach that I post. This is just talking about what some churches do. But then the runaway train was like this categorically wrong, and in fact so wrong it was the exact opposite of the original point. Mm. The original point was not that Elevation was trying to avoid messaging, it was like when do we introduce these difficult concepts when we have an Easter invite card that might have 500 characters on mm -hmm. it. So let's get to, oh right, and then freaking <laughs> Jake from Church Front texted me last night, he's like, you were on Patrick Ben David's podcast. I was like, 
what? Who? <laughs> so uh, I've read a couple of this guy's books. He's like a business guy. Okay. He has a podcast, I suppose. It has 1.7 million subscribers on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And the episode had 500,000 views in its first 24 hours mm-hmm. on YouTube. Now, thankfully, it was a three-hour episode. We were the final we segment. Were right at the end. Yeah. So I don't know how many yeah. people saw it. And it was yeah. a pretty vanilla commentary. It really it, was, but. yeah. So let's talk about <laughs> some of the major claims that came in. The first one was watering down the gospel. You say, hey, you, can't, you have to use these terms on the invites, mm-hmm. otherwise you are watering down mm-hmm. the gospel. The problem with that logic is that an Easter invite cannot include the entire gospel. It, totally. The, the, the resurrection outside of context cannot be understood if you don't also understand the need for the resurrection, yeah. which is before that, the incarnation, the fall, original sin. It's, a, it's what, a long story. Right. <laughs> so if you used, let's say, let's play out this example. You used the words resurrection, Calvary, and blood of Jesus on the invite card. Um, maybe the address isn't there yet. So people can't come. But like you got the words on the invite yeah. card. Um, you would have to then not include other words. And really the whole point of this conversation with Nikki was talking about intentionally using language, which I think is important because I think every church does this unintentionally. Mm-hmm. What would happen is a church or a pastor would post something like, this is watering down the gospel. And then I would go to their website the week before Easter and they would be promoting Easter and not using those words. Mm-hmm. And I would say to them, but you're not using those words. Mm. And then that would spark this conversation of like, yeah, because I'm gonna get to them. And I was like, right. right. That was one of the feedback. Uh, another one that came in is like, what is the biblical support for this approach? So uh, historically, uh, on our content, I have talked about uh, a third of Jesus' teaching in the Synoptic Gospels being dedicated to parables, mm. and how those were these familiar entry points in the society back then, sheep, wine, coins, all that, that then allowed Jesus to talk about these new concepts, the kingdom of God. Some people didn't care for that interpretation. Um, they you know, quoted one part of the Gospels where Jesus says, like, I'm using these words and people won't understand them. Mm. And I think people interpreted that and Biblical interpretation is not uniform. So we can come to different conclusions. But people's interpretation of that was Jesus used parables to purposefully disorient people. If that's the case, one, it hasn't worked because (laughs) the parables have been used by preachers since like the time the gospels were written and recorded as familiar entry points for people. Like my whole life, I have heard people use parables to help me understand the gospel. Mm -hmm. So if Jesus used them to be disorienting, maybe they were disorienting when he said them, As far as I can tell, they have been used as Mm -hmm. great entry points for uh, the understanding of Jesus, Pastor. I I, I totally agree. And and even beyond just like the the, uh, type of story he's telling in in the form of a a parable, I think the broader truth is that he used compelling stories to invite people into deeper relationship, uh, to walk alongside him, both literally and metaphorically, but literally to then talk about the existential truths of the universe, the kingdom of God, in a way um, that can only happen or or best happens in relationship, one on one, one on twelve, if you will. Um, but yeah, I mean, anytime you see him on a on a, on a mountainside or or standing in a boat uh, uh, speaking back towards the the land, like he's using stories to compel people to listen and to appeal to their shared experience, whether it's um, agriculture or or what have you but in a way that invites them into relationship, into following him. And, and that's, I mean, you've said it, that's, that's a, a, a literary device and a literary tactic that we use and have used. I say we as in like humanity <laughs> uses to talk about things because storytelling, it's the most effective form of hu- human communication. It makes this, this connection that allows us to get on the same page and talk about things, whether it's the kingdom of God or math or you know, socioeconomic stuff or whatever, but using storytelling as that bridge invites us into relationship to work through that. And I just think, I think that that's what we're seeing um, in, in, the, in the greater narrative of the gospels, looking at the, the life of Jesus. And um, w- if we're honest with ourselves, preachers, teachers, uh, people in church, we're using this literary device all the time as well. Some, again, some people didn't care for that interpretation. Fine. Um, like, no, no, Jesus used this language to reveal kingdom truths to his disciples. He knew that other people wouldn't get it. And I just think, like, I think what we're meant to observe from that is that, like, if you come to the gospel with a hard heart, you are going to leave confused and disoriented. Mm-hmm. If you come with a soft heart, open to learn, you will find the truth, mm-hmm. right? Knock and enter. Right. Seek and find. Um, we're not purposely making these things 
challenging. Uh, Jesus talks about welcoming, you know, the little children. Mm -hmm. Because the gospel is that easy to understand. But let's say you don't love that one. Let's use a different biblical example. Okay, so Acts 17, Paul talking about Jesus. And he's in a place with some Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. Different religion, Mm -hmm. different worldview. And they're saying, you're talking about some strange things we don't understand. Who is this guy? Is he a babbler? He's not, what he's saying isn't hitting home. So what does he do? He starts quoting the pagan gods. Mm -hmm. He starts talking about, uh, quoting the uh, pagan philosophers. He starts quoting, uh, saying, hey, that's an unknown god over there. And he uses that to basically get to a familiar understanding with these people that have this, they they do not understand Mm -hmm. what he's trying to say. This is a new idea. It's challenging, strange, babbler, making no sense. Uses what they understand to then talk about this is what that actually Mm -hmm. is. If you don't like that one, some people are like, that's blaspheming Paul, okay? If you don't like that one, <laughs> how about this one? I think we can all get to this one. The Bible uses metaphorical language. The bride of Christ. You are not literally married to Jesus. Mm. That is metaphorical language in the Bible to describe the relationship between Christ and the church. Why do we use metaphorical language? Because the idea of Christ being married to a church is not easy. So we talk about it in metaphorical language Mm. to describe the intimacy of such a relationship. So when people said to me, just say the word, I I was like, look, it's not a magic word. If it was a magic word, every person would be saved and every church in America would be overflowing because Mm. we handed out the tracts. Mm. But that wasn't compelling for people to reach, to to, to receive the gospel. Mm. And I don't like it when people then respond and go, whatever, that's their problem. I preached it. I said the words and let let it, let. I understand like the planting of the seeds, but you can't divorce the what from the how. Mm-hmm. So if you approach the way of preaching the gospel the same way over and over again, and you're like, I'm doing the what, I'm doing the what, and you don't care at all about the how, I don't think you're actually doing a good job. You're doing justice to the gospel or justice to the good news in introducing people to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Because I could just look at Alex and I could scream the word resurrection. My veins could be popping out of my temple, my flex of spit hitting him in the face. And if I said all the key words and he didn't, come to know God, that's his fault. Right, but the way I was doing it, how, cannot be divorced from the what. Mm. Uh, another p- uh, pushback, don't worry about offending people. And I, I, I tried to clarify, you know, this isn't about offense. I, I don't know if people are offended by the gospel in America right now mm. as the biggest worry. I think they're more, I don't care. Mm. Like apathy. Apathy yeah. is the bigger problem. 50% of Gen Z no longer identifies as religious at all. Mm. They're agnostic, they're none, they're atheist. They're the least generation in American history. Every generation is becoming less religious Mm -hmm. by the year in the West. So the landscape of faith that's true right now is not what has historically been true. You might come to someone and talk about the resurrection and they'd be like, well, I'm familiar with that term in like fantasy storytelling and I've heard about the Christian like, but like, why does that matter? It doesn't, Mm -hmm. it's, that's a foreign concept to me. So on an invite card, it's like babble. Mm -hmm. It's, Something that's not confu- uh, not accessible. So it wasn't about offense. It was just about like accessibility and really compassion for someone where they are and helping them get to where they want to be. And this is really illustrative of I think people reading into something based on like what you bring to mm-hmm. it because there is this big conversation of like we should be bold about our faith. People are offended by our faith. Uh, again, I don't really buy that interpretation as like this big broad issue. I would say apathy is a much mm. bigger issue. Um, but people feel like we need to be more bold. People are offended by the Christian faith. We need to speak it in boldness. It's like, well, you're bringing someone to this conversation that is actually not what we're talking about. So we've done these interviews with, um, with uh, Transformation Church, with Elevation Church, with VU Church. And then last week we did one with a uh, or a couple of weeks ago, we did one with the Cornerstone Fellowship. Mm-hmm. And I was excited for this interview because it was a largely unknown church relative to the previous three. And one of the first questions that came in or comments under the YouTube video yeah. was, love your content, guys. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your savior? I literally asked that question. And I was like, if people ask that sometimes, but I'm like, love our content. I was like, I mean, yes, we both know the Lord. Uh, Alex's lower third says pastor, mm-hmm. if within the first minute of every show. Mm-hmm. Um, talked a little bit about, about our history. His, his bigger question was like, how do you decide what, Church is the platform. Right. Because every church you're platforming is unb- unbiblical. Mm. And I said, I was like, look, everyone has interpreted his uh, theology different for uh, ever and probably forever will. I know people don't like that statement. Mm. Um, if you are a Calvinist, some Calvinists believe non-Calvinism is heresy. Some non-Calvinists believe Calvinism is heresy. Mm. Calvinism only came about after the rest, uh, you know, as part of the Reformation, like around that time. So... 
that means like either half of all Christians are like heretics, right. or you, you you're only not a heretic now. Like if you were a Calvinist and believed that that theology was heresy, if you didn't hold to it, would you not read early Christian church fathers? Like would you not read that text because you're like they must all be heretics because this theology didn't exist then? I mean, I, even even like personally, like I don't believe some of the things I believed ten years ago. And so, what does that mean for uh, ten years older version of me? For great now, question, you know, it's like you, you you wouldn't have confidence that you right now have it correct right. because historically you have in your understanding now not had things correct. Yeah, and so that's what you're getting to, and the way you replied to that comment on YouTube was like, yeah, I mean, I I've embodied non biblical ways of of faith, and surely am, and surely will, and we if we are all uh, uh, self reflective enough, we might admit that of ourselves, and so. Uh, I think <laughs> I think you're you're fair to suggest that everyone we platform is non-biblical in some way, and so what are we going to do with that? Who how do we choose who to platform? Yeah, and so I talked about hey, if I had reason to believe that a church would not stand behind the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, choose your creed of choice. Sure, um, those are ours. I, I likely wouldn't platform them. Yeah, um, I'm confident every church that we've platformed would stand behind that. Mm -hmm. You might believe that they're lying. <laughs> I can only take them right at. Their word. Mm -hmm. if, if there's anything about this situation, there's really two takeaways for me. One, like, I feel like it's regrettable that all of this annoyance has like been heaped upon elevation. Mm -hmm. Like, if you go to some of their social posts, it's just people like yelling three words yeah. in all caps, or like Nikki personally. Yeah, yeah. which um, is unfortunate. And the second thing, and maybe this is like, as I reflect on it, perhaps this is like the mistake that I made, and it's an it's a very ironic mistake. The whole point of the original like conversation was if you only had limited number of characters probably means there are certain topics that you just don't want to discuss mm -hmm. not because you want people to be offended not because you just like it, it can't work in that medium mm. you know the famous canadian philosopher marshall McLuhan. the medium is the message that's you can't divorce the what from the how i did not have 500 characters i had 10 slides and it was you know a thousand words on this carousel mm -hmm. there was a caption to go along with it there were disclaimers throughout and 95 percent of our audience received it in good faith mm -hmm. even if they disagreed mm -hmm. and most agreed with the point of the post yeah and then it reached the secondary audience and it was not received in that way and maybe the reflection is this entire discussion works maybe in a 40-minute workshop where you're like speaking with people in real time mm -hmm. in the same way that you could discuss the theology of the resurrection and the incarnation and uh, the fall and original sin and why Jesus came and why it matters for eternal life in the context of a 40 minute message, but you mm -hmm. couldn't on an Easter invite card. Mm -hmm. Maybe this entire like discussion, it was naive and foolish of me to put it into a post because the point that I was making should have also applied to my own content. Had this, is this the time and place? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's fair, um, I, and, and I think that's true. And I wonder if why that I wonder if that's why it was received so well by our audience is like twofold. First of all, there's like there's social trust with the folks who who follow our content, and then and and with you, so they know like they know our message as a company and Brady's message as a person, and so they get to filter that singular piece of content through that. Um, like relational history, albeit online, but relational history, and then and then uh, secondly, it's very possible, even plausible, that a lot of the folks who saw that Instagram post had listened to the entire conversation first, had listened to the show, and so that post in the context of our forty or fifty or sixty minute conversation with Nikki is digested in an entirely different way if that piece of content stands alone um, to itself. And so this is just like to me, it's so. It so like um, embodies the risk of these discovery algorithms and these secondary audiences, which is seeing a piece of content, especially that first slide, that like strong slide. Here's why Elevation doesn't use doesn't use uh, the word resurrection this Easter or wh whatever that, on their Easter on invites. Their Easter invite. How old? You see, you got me. But it's like for folks in a secondary audience who see that come across one of their friend's stories or whatever because they shared it or they see it in their feed. Um, they have no like equity with Brady Shearer or pro church tools. Mm -hmm. And so like on a, on a neurological level, there's like, there's this, uh, I'm going to use a buzzword. Are you ready? There's this like triggering that happens. There's like an, an activation of mm -hmm. like actually like, um, um, 
neurologically, like, like on a biological sense, your amygdala gets triggered. Oh, I have this presupposition about who elevation is or what they do. And now I'm seeing they're not using the word resurrection. Now, all of a sudden you're disoriented to the point where, because your amygdala is activated, you are swiping right past the disclaimer. You're not reading the Also, the intellectual part of your brain doesn't work when the amygdala is activated, so. So like your critical- You're blind to it. Yes, your critical thought is just out the window and you don't even have an opportunity to engage with the content um, objectively because maybe you're pre- your, your presupposition is confirmed by what you just think you read mm-hmm. or what you read in part. And then it just catches on like wildfire. And like you said, the even the publications, the trusted publications that talked about this, relevant being one, like miscategorized the entire situation because of how distorted the conversation had gotten by the time it reached, it reached that point. Which is so, funny because it's not broken telephone. The source material- It's there. Exists. Yes, yeah. But if you search in Google for this, what you'll find is one of the first aggregated articles that, to be fair to them, links to the full interview, yeah. but indexes a certain part of yeah. it in a small paragraph, yeah. and who's gonna watch an hour interview? Right. Uh, 1% of yeah. people, maybe? Yeah. And you know what, respect to everyone in the comments, I saw you, there weren't many of you by the time people like, actually, the interview is just, <laughs> yeah. just getting drowned out in like, say the word, <laughs> yeah. say it. <laughs> But I, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the risk of, of, uh, of getting caught up in secondary audience audiences. And surprisingly, this happened, this hasn't happened earlier. Well, I mean, maybe, but like we, for the longest time have a very small portion of our content is let's look at this influential church. Sure. Because like, it's easy in a sense because it, it draws numbers, but like, I think you have a responsibility as a creator Mm. to you know, create from conviction that you have yeah. and not just do things for clicks. And I was really proud of all the interviews that we've mm-hmm. done recently. Um, each one of them has been accompanied by some level of drama mm-hmm. that I'm like, really? And it kind of makes you go, all right, fine. I'm just gonna go back to like writing about my stats and like writing about <laughs> like, you know, here's a new DM automation tactic mm-hmm. that you can use. Cause people like that just as much. But when it comes to reaching new audiences, in the thrust that we've described so far. If you start at a familiar entry point, oh, I know this church. Mm -hmm. That's a great way to introduce new people, which is a noble way of, you know, reaching new audiences. Um, So it's it's murky, it's it's tricky, and, uh, you know, we're just gonna get back to answering these questions, and fewer people will click on this episode because it is not (laughs) as uh, as inflammatory. Yeah, we're safe, at least for now. Next question that has nothing to do with Elevation Church. What is your favorite recent tech trend? How about you go first? You're going to answer this in the negative. Mm. Talk about what you hate. (laughs) Well, on a recent episode, we had a segment called Send It Back, which is, you know, something, a trend we're seeing that we just don't want anything to do with. We need to send it back. And and I answered mine, but then I was like, moving on. I didn't let you answer (laughs) yours. That's okay. And that's that's how I feel about this recent tech trend. And for me, it's the... um, it's the the increase in the influx of generative AI content. So I'm not just talking about um, artificial intelligence or or um, augmented intelligence uh, or even automations um, in the sense of of a lot of the tools we use. And ha- I used one this morning. I used ChatGPT this morning to help me with something I'm working on. And this is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about generative AI in the form of content, whether it be like photos or videos specifically. We're seeing a rise in this. Um, you know, both like uh, um, empirically and anecdotally, but we, we've all seen it come across our feeds. Um, images and videos that we know have been generated by uh, an algorithm, by a computer. I mentioned just recently on the show, I was reading my local newspaper. And when I say local newspaper, I mean local newspaper. Like uh, we were away last week and when I got home on the counter was the issue that I missed. My dad had brought it to the house and left it there for me. Front page, I should have I should have wrote down the headline. Front, I think I remember it actually. Front page, center, like not just like hidden on the front page. This is this is the content. Could this be Niagara's oldest resident? It's a picture of a dog. And the whole the whole content is that there's this Bijan freeze somewhere in Niagara on the Lake who's 22 years old, which is like a hundred and whatever in doggy years. And this this is center, front page, and this that's, is how local this is. That's wholesome, wholesome. So I mentioned a few weeks ago on this very show, 
I was reading that very newspaper and there was an article about um, the Four Mile Creek, which is a, a beloved place for me and about how it needs to be cleaned up. There's a lot of deadfall that needs to be cleaned up. And there was a picture that associated the article and it was a picture of a creek with deadfall. And underneath, I always look to see like um, who's, who's accredited with taking the pictures because it's such a small place. Sometimes I know who's taking the photos. And the credit was Mid Journey, which for those listening who don't know, is like one of the most um, common and accessible photo and proficient photo generative softwares online right now. It's not It's not like a, a name of a gen alpha, like Mid Journey. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I want to send that back too. Um, but no, it was this picture that was generated online by this local newspaper because they couldn't send, you know, Ben out to the Four Mile Creek to take a photo or they chose not to. And this is something I really want to send back. This is a tech trend that not just as a creator, because sure, surely there's a part of me that as a creator, someone who like really values the creative process behind photos and videos is like a bit offended by that. But very practically and for a long time, Humanity has used photos and specifically video as a record of truth mm. for an event. Like just recently that that um, bridge in mm. Baltimore tragically just like crumpled. After or that. did it? No, it definitely did. <laughs> right. It was tragic. And it's like when I see a video of that, because I've been conditioned that video is record of truth, like I, I see the proof and I'm like, oh, this is what happened. But I fear with the rise of generative AI and specifically in the context of photo and video and video. Now I saw a video yesterday yeah, online. I saw the same one of like, uh, it was a, it was a woman in a car in the front seat of a car, just like a lot of mommy bloggers. I use that term affectionately, uh, affectionately, not, not disparagingly, but like mommy bloggers who, um, who, you know, they're sitting in the parking lot waiting to pick their kids up and they're taking a selfie video to talk about this new water bottle that, that they love. And there's an affiliate link in the, in the caption. And this video that was posted was entirely generated by AI. And for me, it was easy to spot. But for a lot of people, it's not. And it's only easy to spot when you click in it and watch it attentively. Right. Which is not how anyone watches anything. And in a year from now, it will be indistinguishable from real anyway. Exactly. And that's such a great point because I saw the post and the caption along with the post was like, this is AI. So when I'm watching it, my red flags are already up. But if I watch that video like I watch most videos, which is on mute reading captions, uh, distracted doing something else, would I have been able to spot that? And like you said, surely five years from now, we will not be able to spot that. Uh, take cues from, what's it called, Sora? Mm. Like that new video generative software that is like, it's still not, it's not perfect, but it's the best we've seen. And Sora has big limitations if you wanted to use it in like Hollywood's context, because you can never use the same background twice. Yeah. So like if you were like, oh, we're gonna use Sora to fill in this scene that we had to reshoot, it's like, well, you you can't yet give it material to build from. It only works off of text. And then you also cannot reuse something. So if you're like, give me a pigeon in the sky. Give me a pigeon in the sky. You can't like get the pigeon from a different angle. Yeah, That's only gonna be true for like one year. And yeah. then it will, so yeah, this is terrifying. And I also wanna send it back. And if I go into my favorite tech trend, yes, it's really do. the antithesis of this. And it's creators that are trying to get closer to more human ways of communicating and mm. publishing online. Mr. Beast, you know, well uh, publicized, came out a few months ago, I think at this point, was like, hey, we're gonna start editing a little bit slower, not as frantically, mm. because we think that that's actually like more uh, flourishing. It's like better for the human experience. Yeah. And if someone as influential as he can say that, I mean, look at Mr. Beast's thumbnails and then look at all of YouTube's thumbnails. He's setting the trends mm -hmm. for the entire platform. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Uh, TikTok, being dominated by phone videos that are apparently all AI, unfortunately. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, they're shot as is. It's just, hey, this is me in the lighting that I'm in. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, TikTok does add like a very subtle beauty filter to pretty much everything mm -hmm. that is sometimes indetectable. But you look at yourself, you're like, oh, I look good on TikTok. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a reason why. Yeah. Um, so it's not perfect. But Gen Z's push towards... We don't want things to be as uh, creatively styled. We don't want things to be as produced mm. and prepared. We want it to just be like, as is. Um, and then of course, marketers will come in and will ruin that version of reality. And then we'll have to find a new way to be authentic and genuine. But in the midst of AI penetrating every part of society, I am encouraged by the human spirit wanting to do things that are genuine. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's gonna be hijacked by you know marketers. But 
as long as the thrust and desire for that exists, we will find ways, I believe, to navigate this, whether it's you know actual verification that this is not AI. Mm -hmm on content mm -hmm. that we will see as like this tiny little like, you know, symbol in the top right corner of anything that's published. And it will give us this instant trust in it. Whereas when we don't see it, we will not trust. Like we, if we don't get something like that, we're all like very much in trouble. And I think there's, there's a general like sense of agreement with that. Uh, surely there are, there are some, some fractions of the population who who are like like really doubling down on AI and think like it's the future. But I think generally like from a humanity perspective, I think we know this, I think it's it's backed up by data as well. Um, and so to a recent conversation we had, we were talking about just tech, technology and how, and, and I said on this show like, yeah, like we're only moving forward, we can't go back. And in a lot of senses, I still believe that to be true. I don't believe it to be universally true though. And I, I, that's my hope and actually my expectation with how we wrestle with um, like AI generated content is like, yeah, the technology is new, it's cool. We're doing like impressive things with it. But I think I think our collective sense of this, like on the whole is, yeah, if this becomes our new record of truth or erases uh, authentic video from being a record of truth, like we're all in big trouble. So actually my expectation is that we will see um, the use of AI kind of regress to like a palatable means um, I, I, I can't predict what that will be, um, like some sort of verification tool, which seems likely. But I think right now it's just like, this is new, this is novel, we're playing with it. But I don't see uh, the, the use of it and the kind of integration of it into our daily lives as a trend like up, up and infinitely to the right. I think it will, I, my hope and expectation is that it will kind of regress to a palatable means. Yeah, it also might like, as we see with most trends, new thing, unbridled, do whatever you want with it, overcorrect, huge regulation, and then, okay, here's a healthy way, yeah. quote unquote, that we can use it. Yeah. I think other people would say, no, like Pandora's box. Away we go. Yikes. Yikes indeed. Next question. Hey, Brady, I forgive me. I'm going to spell your name, and then I'm going to make an effort to say it. C-H-I-E-L. From the Netherlands, I'm going to go with Shell. Oh, interesting. I was thinking Chiel. Hmm. All the way from the Netherlands. I'm part of a group of people from our church who lead a worship night every three months. We noticed that since COVID, the attendance is reduced by more than 50%. I try to post often on our Instagram profile, but it doesn't do much. I can't apply all the tips you provide because we aren't a church. We're just a worship night. And also, most of our current audience is probably 40 years and older. Can you give me some tips? Yeah, let's use Instagram how it was originally intended to use here. You're a worship night. You're not going to have a sermon that you can repurpose uh, into sermon clips for Instagram. Yep. You've got folks that are older, so maybe they're not going to resonate with like some of the same trends. Maybe they're not into reels just yet because they're a bit older. They remember Instagram for what it first was, and that's what they wish that it was. Photos of worship nights are incredibly effective on social media. One of the reasons is because we love to interact with photos of other people. Mm -hmm. Two, we love to see photos of people that we recognize. And three, the human emotion of a worship night is on full display when you can capture mm -hmm. it. And that is potent and powerful, and it's organic, it's real. Yeah. It's not contrived, it's not staged. And that cuts through a lot of the noise and a lot of the barriers of mistrust that we put up on social media because we know we're trying to be bam bamboozled at every single corner. It also plays a really important theological or missiological uh, purpose because what is church or a worship night? It's the gathering of the saints. Mm -hmm. We talk about this frequently. It will never get overset. The church is one of the very few organizations in the world where people of different ages, different ethnicities, different socioeconomic backgrounds, yep. different insert anything, gather together for a shared purpose. And then we scatter. Mm -hmm. The saints scatter throughout the week. And when you're on Instagram and you scroll and you see a photo of the worship night and it's emotional and it's real, and it breaks down the boundaries that you're kind of like subconsciously putting up as you scroll on social, yeah. it reminds you, hey, I have a family beyond my blood relatives. I have a place where I belong that is not work where I have to go, yeah. where we're kind of forced to belong. I have a place where I belong, and we're not together right now, but the weekend is coming, or in the case of a worship mm -hmm. night, Tuesday night is coming, mm -hmm. Friday night is coming. This is not going to boost your attendance 10X overnight, right. but it's the perfect outflow, it's congruent with what you're doing in person. That's one of the principles we frequently cite. 
how do I approach social? My church or my worshiping is different. Okay, here's a principle that's universal no matter what. What you're doing in person, what you do online, they should be congruent with one another. How can you take what you're doing in person and mirror that in a genuine way online? Photography, the worship night, it's one of the truest, purest ways of doing that. Yeah, another type of post that has tendency to get traction in a discovery algorithm or go viral, as they say, are like worship moments. It's true. And for that very thing you're talking about, it's like, and we've talked about it recently, you get this fly on the wall experience of a very authentic, not contrived, not manufactured, not produced moment. It's like, oh, this happened in a time and a space. What I'm seeing and what I'm hearing is really authentic. And so you have great opportunity here if you're filming these worship nights and if you're not, maybe consider filming them, is to film these worship nights. And it sounds like, what do they say? They have them every three months. So film these worship nights and don't unload that content on your Instagram account like all at once, all in the next week. Film it, chop it up, and keep some of those worship moments and post them sporadically throughout those three months for a couple reasons. One, in the era of discovery algorithm, at any point those worship moments could get picked up by the algorithm, could go viral, because likely a lot of the songs you're singing are familiar to a lot of people in the broader church culture. And then two, for the people who were there, that type of moment to see it come across your feed six weeks from now is nostalgic for what they experienced that night. They'll be they'll be so happy to see that again. They'll be able to meet God there again. They'll very likely share it. Um, and then if you are if you are recording these worship nights and posting them to YouTube, each one of these short worship moments that you choose to post sporadically over the next three months can link back to your, your YouTube so people can engage either for the first time with that worship night or rewatch it from uh, if they were there the first time. So you have a real opportunity to sit on that content and post it strategically and sporadically, as opposed to just kind of like, oh, we filmed it, and here's the link to it a few nights after it happened. No, you can you can post that, much like uh, sermon shorts. You can post that sporadically over time to keep people engaged, and like I said, kind of hit on that nostalgic element of like, oh yeah, we were there, and that was awesome. I remember what God did that night. I remember what God said to me that night, um, and get people to feel that again online. I would also recommend that you don't evenly space it out between those three months. You don't wanna have long gaps, mm. you know, no weeks off, but I would more heavily publish for the first two weeks right after, and then the four weeks leading up. Right. As soon as people leave, you wanna remind them like right after. It's like when you come home from like a conference, yeah. and you're just like, I am feeling different right now, mm -hmm. and like I am really focused, and then two weeks later, like, you know, you're back into the thrust of life, it's like, okay, you know, I, I, that feeling has dissipated a little bit, mm -hmm. so you wanna capitalize on that, and then leading up to the next one, you want to start like building that momentum as you get closer. Yep. Um, if you do that all like in the middle month, there's no action people can take. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be mindful of like when the in-person events are happening and then structure your content density closer to those spots. That's great. Moving on. Hey Brady, I was recently approached and told I need to get more of a variety of photographs on Sundays, different people instead of just the same ones. But the problem is the same people serve week in and week out and some just flat out don't look like they want to be at church. <laughs> How do you achieve grabbing different photos than your normal ones? Or how do you explain to leadership why it's rather hard to do so? Why is it rather hard? Look, senior leaders, our church is miserable. <laughs> Can't take pictures of your kids because they don't look like they want to be here, pastor. Hey, so I've been there. I've been there. <laughs> uh, nothing's going to make people look more awkward or stiff in a photography setting um, than when they know they're being photographed. Especially in such a vulnerable place as like a worship setting. So... Long lenses are gonna be your friend here. Mm -hmm. For church photography, this is so important. Long lens being like a 70 to 200 that you can have on the camera body and be you know, 50 feet, 20 feet away from someone and capture a photo of them yep. just in their moment there, mm -hmm. but it, they don't know you're yep. taking the photo. Yep. Um, or if nothing else, they don't feel like you're like over their shoulder. Um, you know, sometimes we'll get, we'll get photos and we'll see, you know, these photos taken in churches where people are like, kind of like looking at the camera, they're like side eyeing it. Cause mm -hmm. you're like, ah, you were kind of like right there. Um, in a church where photography is done often or where there are a lot of young people, it doesn't bother them. Um, in a church where it's rare or you have older people that just haven't grown up taking photos or having yeah. their photo taken like every day nonstop, it's a foreign experience. And so they can look stiff. Your church might be miserable mm -hmm. or that might be create that might be something that's being created or exaggerated because yeah. of the uh, element of photography. And then the question here is like, how do I get different photos? Well, the easiest answer is to 
do something different. Mm -hmm. So different focal lengths, we just discussed. Different settings, different vantage points, different distances. Put yourself in different positions mm -hmm. to give yourself the opportunity to capture something entirely different. Here's a really practical solution. People are surely not miserable the entire time at church. Like, if you're walking up to church, and maybe this is outdoor lighting, so the lighting's gonna be best. Some of the best photos we get from churches are when it's outdoors. You're walking up to church, and there's a smiling greeter with an outstretched hand. Mm -hmm. You gotta be in a real bad mood to return that negative energy. Yeah, yeah. What you're likely gonna do is mirror that greeter's energy. So if you know, man, we are having a difficult time taking photos of different people and without them looking sad. Great, we're gonna stand with a long lens, mm -hmm. so at a safe distance, near the doors, everyone that enters the church, well, they're gonna have, to, like, that'll be everyone. Yeah. You can't go to church if you don't enter the door. So like, you're gonna have to get everyone, and you're gonna have a greeter that's bringing them some positive energy, mm -hmm. meaning they're more likely to return that positive energy. So, solved. There you go. Okay, this next one's a doozy. Our church name is, and not just a doozy, it's sh surely uh, uh, something that a lot of churches can empathize with. Our church name is Community Church of Portage Lakes. Our current domain is ccpl.life and social handles cc, capital CC, lowercase of, capital case PL. I'd really like to move away from the initialism for clarity and communications, but community church is quite common and not many domains and handles are available. The best I think we found is communitychurch.pl handles like social handles would still be community church PL. It's clearer, somewhat concise. So the question is, is this worth the change? Is it worth the longer name, especially since it's still not a .com? Also, I'm worried that since .pl is a geographical domain suffix, it will negatively impact my SEO. Should I be worried about that? Is meta tags and text on my pages enough to let Google know that I'm not actually in Poland? No, you're in Poland. Now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not advisable to use a geographic uh, TLD, yeah. top level domain, for a number of reasons. Because mm -hmm. um, you're not in Poland. Yeah. yeah. A a SEO maybe is a part of it, but it's more like there are certain regulations um, that different geographic TLDs, like mm. they have control over those things. Right. So they could like, take your domain away, changes could happen in eight years mm. where they take your domain away. Oh man, we're like, we shouldn't have got this in the first place, but now eight years later, the rules got changed. CCPL.life isn't terrible, which is what makes this question a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. And you can hear it in the questioner's tones. Like, is it worth this? Like, yeah. CCPL isn't terrible. My rule for acronyms is that you don't want any longer than three letters, with the exception, mm -hmm. if two of the, Consecutive letters are identical. For example, NCAA. Of course. Or in this case, CCPL. So this would pass. So then would you say double CPL? I probably wouldn't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but isn't it funny? NCAA is fewer syllables, but NCAA sounds better. Right. Interesting. Uh, let's talk about rules for domain names. Three rules. Short, memorable, and easy to spell. Mm -hmm. CCPL.life already has two of those. It's short and it's easy to spell. Yeah. And you might be able to make the case, the argument that it's memorable because it doesn't break the acronym rule. Mm -hmm. CCPL.life, that, that, that's pretty memorable. The only yeah. reason acronyms aren't memorable is because you know the acronym, but nobody else does. That's right. NCAA is synonymous in the culture's lexicon. Mm -hmm. um, CCPL, of course, is not even for people that maybe attend your church. Now, depending on, I went to a church called Alliston Pentecostal Church growing up, and APC was pretty synonymous in our church's lexicon, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be to the broader community. Right. So, my preferred alternative in cases like this, when you have a church's name that's very, very common, and you're like, I've tried every domain suffix, I've tried every, you know, orientation of mm -hmm. the word, is to leverage the area code of the region. Okay. And the reason I like the area code is because unlike your three-letter acronym, uh, the area code is known in the lexicon of everyone in your church mm -hmm. and beyond. This can be sometimes sticky if you have multiple area codes, which a lot of places do now, but community330.org is available. Mm. Um, 330 is a very good area code. Yeah. Community330.church, .net, .info, .life, .co are all available, not .com. Community330.org, is that good enough to replace mm. ccpl.life? I'm not convinced. 
I think ccpl.life is easy to spell, and the word community is not easy to spell. Yeah. I don't know what it is. It's not especially tricky. It's not like, oh, are there two T's or two M's? Like, I think people typically know it's two M's and mm -hmm. one T. But there's something about the word community that is not especially easy to say, and sometimes spelling it is tough. Mm -hmm. So ccpl.life versus community three three. Zero.org. See, I'm even stumbling in as yeah, I say it. Yeah, to say. Now, yeah. I, the thing is, though, it's not my area code. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't stumble over 780. Right, or like Central 905. Right. Yeah. I would never stumble over that at yeah. all. But 330 isn't mine. So everyone listening might be like, oh, Community 330, that's no good. Or Community 330, that's no good. Yeah. But the person that asked this question is hearing it differently than every one of us is hearing yeah. it. Yeah. And the people that are in the geographic region of that church would hear it differently than every one of us would. So it's really... Only they can decide if, oh, Community 330. Now that sounds good. Maybe it does. Yeah. And Community 330 probably is available on social handles too. This is the other reason I like it. It's very uncommon for social handles to be taken and URLs to be taken when you combine like your church's main word with an area code. Mm -hmm. People just aren't taking that. And so mm -hmm. it presents a ton of possibilities. Community 330 is also a good social handle. It's a good cafe. It's a good cafe. Kids 330, mm. uh, uh, U330. Um, groups 330, 330. Someone could design you a nice little 330 brand mark, just a 330. Maybe it's 330. Who knows how they stylize it, yeah. how they say it. It's tough though, when you have a church name that's like, that has community church or First Methodist or Your Life, Life Abundant, Abundant or and I'm Central. Central. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's tough. It's crazy though. We went with centralcc.pl. Um, yeah, and then the Polish authorities. <laughs> <laughs> Did go with CA though. Yes, because our, we are Canadian, and yeah. if you are in a country like that, you might not need to use the area code if you're yeah. American, or if you really want that .com, it becomes more. Um, That's why dot .church, dot .life is nice for churches, mm -hmm. because it's like, it's an identifier in the same way that a geographical one is, but for the type of organization you are, not where you are. And shockingly, community.church is not <laughs> yeah. available. <laughs> All right, next. Hey, Brady, thanks for all the ideas. I'm on the social media team in my church. We've been learning a lot. I want to ask, though, we usually experience low views on our Insta, Insta stories. Why do you think that is? Would love to hear from you. So the stories, alg uh, the stories algorithm is different from the reels and feed algorithm. Instagram has come out and told us this. Mm -hmm. What that means is if you approach stories and the content you're publishing there in the same way you approach reels or the feed, mm -hmm. it's not weird to experience different outcomes. And that's because the biggest positive signal for the stories algorithm is uh, personal affinity. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm very likely to see Alex's stories and him to see mine because we know each other in person. Right. That positive signal doesn't really apply to the feed mm -hmm. algorithm and the reels algorithm, but it does in a big way to stories. So this puts every church account at a disadvantage right out of the blocks yeah. because you're a brand and not a human. Mm -hmm. And so people cannot have the same affinity with you as a brand mm -hmm. as they can with anyone else as a human. So understanding that, you can't change it, what can we do? You can use the polls feature mm -hmm. native to Instagram stories. This is like the easiest way to hack attention yeah. and hack views. You can use that as the first slide and then kind of follow up with content that you want people to see. Yeah. You want to limit the use of links in your stories. Link stories are just going to see just a- They do not do well at all. Precipitous drop relative yeah. to other content. And then when posting stories, you may not be able to change the fact that you, the church, are a brand account with a logo as your avatar and not like a smiling face. Mm -hmm. But you can still post like a real person does yeah. on Instagram stories. You follow those three things and you should see some pretty immediate improvements. Yeah, those are great tips. Next question, what are the chances that you have a nice breakdown or visual aid that shows the average amount of time that your creative communication, marketing, content creation, and general tech takes? By type would be spectacular if possible. Thank you in advance. T-I-A. Yeah. T-I-A. <laughs> Thank you in advance. Alex. Nice. I ran the numbers on this. Of course. <laughs> so let's go by- no, no visual aid. No, I didn't make a, this is a, a spreadsheet. You know, this is still, it's an audio medium, <laughs> yeah. even if it is on YouTube. Yeah. So um, I've got numbers for YouTube, for podcast, for carousels, and for read, mm -hmm. uh, reels. So a YouTube script takes me about two hours to write, takes me about one hour to film, mm -hmm. color, and process the sound, takes the editors on average five hours to edit, and then another hour or so to prep mm -hmm. for publishing. So that's 
nine hours total. So like one working day. Yeah. The same is for the podcast, except the script takes me one hour to write. And then it's because it's so much longer. It's like two hours to film, color and process the sound. Similarly, five hours to edit, even though it's way longer. A podcast has fewer edits mm -hmm. than a YouTube video. So it takes roughly the same time to edit and then another hour or so to prep. So nine hours total on average. Carousels take me about an hour to write. 30 minutes to design, 30 minutes to prep and post. That's two hours total per mm -hmm. carousel. And then reels take me about 30 minutes to write, 30 minutes to film, color, and process the sound, and two hours to edit. So three hours total. All right. There you go. What do you think? How do you think? So for churches who are making carousels and reels from content that they're not creating, you've got a social media manager who's creating reels and carousels from a sermon that they didn't preach presumably it would take even even less amount of time because you're not having to create the content from scratch. So maybe it wouldn't take an hour to write a carousel from your sermon because you've already listened to it, you've already chopped it up. It's only taking you maybe, if you're using Canva, if you've got a template, maybe it's taking you 15 minutes to design. And so we've been talking about carousels and reels uh, on the show for ages now. Like creating those types of posts from, from a content that's already been created for you, it's really, like, it's really not a big investment from you time-wise. Listen, this question was about me. This is how long it takes me. All right. <laughs> Next question. Also for you. Where should your faith formation or... Yeah, that, 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 was a little, <laughs> that was a little pointed, wasn't it? <laughs> Where should your faith formation or religious education registration be shown? We're talking about the website. So right away on the homepage or somewhere else with proper communication to the right audience. My leader, my church is pushing for homepage and I just cringe. She isn't listening to all the reasons not to. So I need an expert to weigh in. See, I told you this one's for you. <laughs> hey, you know, you know a thing or two about church websites. Yeah. So we have a, a rule, the 50% rule. Mm -hmm. This is for any church-wide communication, announcements, social posts, and I would include the homepage of your okay. church's website. If it doesn't apply to 50% or more of the people that are gonna see that yep. announcement, see that homepage, see that social post, it doesn't belong there. That's interesting. I love that we're bringing the 50% rule to talking about church website homepages. That makes a lot of sense. Here's the great thing. Everyone can win in this uh, conversation, your leader and the mm -hmm. cringing questioner, mm -hmm. because of this handy little website plugin we created for free for every church works on every website called the launcher. Because you can put all of your most important actions on the launcher. And guess what? The launcher mm -hmm. is on every single page. So if your senior leader is adamant and overrules you on making sure it's on the homepage, you can gladly, let's put it on the launcher. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do you one better, not on the homepage. Every on page. Every page. Yeah. And that way you're not using an entire section dedicated to something that is, if I'm understanding it, faith formation or religious education. So I'm guessing this is some type of like new Christian class. It sounds like it. Like yeah. alpha. Yeah. You know, something like that. Um, growth track. Yeah. Like, and, and to the questioner, like, I would agree that probably because your homepage is the landing spot for most, if not all new visitors to your site, it's not appropriate or even reasonable to invite them into growth track if they're just visiting your your church's website and have never stepped foot through the door but to the to the leader's opinion it is relevant to have that information like readily accessible on the website and and it sounds to me and now this is just presumption but it sounds to me that they they know how valuable it is and so they want to put it in a in a place of prominence on the website. And so that's why the launcher works great for this, for those listening and and maybe uh, even for those watching. Like the, the launcher, the, the way it works, it's a little widget down in the bottom right or left-hand corner of your website, and it works on just about any website. And you can have a little logo, your church logo, or you can have it on my church, it says next steps. You can have a little foot emoji to signify next steps. And when you click on that launcher, because it's on every page of your church's website, it opens up either, either small, um, like, uh, overlay style, or you could set it to open full screen, which is how I have it on my church website. And in there you can have any and every next step that belongs to your church. And so growth track, alpha, um, staff, your church's beliefs, all these things that are really important to your church and how you want people to interact with your website, but don't deserve to clog up the homepage, making it, um, you know, just, uh, a, a mess of, of every piece of information that's relevant to every type of person that uses the website. And so that, that's the strength of the launcher is that you can put anything and everything that's important nested inside that launcher so that it's not clogging up the web browsing experience, but it is accessible, just as accessible as anything that would be on the homepage. 
Um, and that's how we're using the launcher at my church as well. Now, another option, because the senior leader might come back to you and say, well, you know, people are gonna come to our website after like visiting for the first time and they're gonna be like, oh man, I had a great time at church, like what's next for yep. me? So one thing that you could do is you could schedule a banner, like a recurring banner, and mm -hmm. the launcher can power this as well, where like every Sunday at noon until like Monday at dinner time or Monday, yeah, that's good. Tuesday at yep. midnight, Monday at midnight, you could have a banner that says, register for our new visitors class. It would get prominent display mm -hmm. at the top of the page, but it would obviously be a temporary thing, mm -hmm. so you're not then taking away from the rest of the site. People can tell, they can intuit, like this is a, a promotional element that is timely. Yeah. Because the question is going to assuredly come in, wait a minute, if we are gonna be promoting anything related to new visitors, connect card, new visitors class, growth track alpha, that's never gonna pass the 50% rule. Mm -hmm. And this is where I would say, well, here's where the interpretation of the 50% rule is very important because we also have a subsequent rule called sprint and smuggle. And the smuggle is where you can promote pretty much anything you want, so long as it's framed in a way that's valuable to everyone. So the way that if I wanted to do a church announcement, let's say, for a new visitors class, I would say, tell a story about a person that came to a new visitors class mm -hmm. and how their faith was built and how they got connected to the church. That story is something that every single person in our church needs to hear because right. that's mission. Mm -hmm. It's me casting vision for everything that our church is a part of. You give to this, you come early and you volunteer, you attend, mm -hmm. this was you at mm -hmm. one time mm -hmm. or another, and this is the story of a person getting connected to church, getting connected to faith, becoming an integrated member, and then I pivot to the class. Mm -hmm. Now I've passed the 50% rule because every single thing that I said built the mission, mm -hmm. built faith in the congregation, New, old, young, old, mm -hmm. people that have been there, mm -hmm. involved, not involved. And now I get to smuggle in that promotion at the end. Yeah. And then I could have that banner That's temporary right. on right. the site. So when people go online, they see it there. Or I'd give them the direct link to the launcher, right. which has a vanity URL, ccpl.life, ever heard of it? Yeah. That takes you to yes. the launcher. Yeah, there you go. And now the first featured action that I have set up yeah. is the Next Steps class. And I only have that as the featured action for uh, today and tomorrow, I'm gonna move it on Tuesday, mm. but I know that this announcement is gonna drive traction to that URL, and they're gonna look for it. It's the featured action, it's the most prominent. Man, what what you're describing is, is a real effective way to use your church's website as an active tool in ministry, um, as opposed to just using it as a static yellow page, right? But like, our church websites, especially now, it's, it's the year of our Lord 2024. Our websites, especially ones powered by Nucleus and the Launcher, are so capable of facilitating every next step of your church. And so it's a bit of a paradigm shift for a lot of folks. And I, I know this from speaking with pastors and churches who, who are moving from one website to another or just changing philosophy. This is how we've been using our website, but we're really compelled by this idea. Um, this is what it looks like to use your church's website as an active tool in ministry, to, to marry it to what you're doing in service on Sunday and provide a, a really... Um, like low barrier or uh, low cost um, entry way to take a really important next step to sign up for growth track, to sign up for alpha. Alpha. This is, uh, yeah, I mean, like th this, is, this is a paradigm shift for a lot of folks, but this is what we believe about church websites is that they should be and can be active tools in ministry and not just static yellow pages anymore. Indeed. Moving on. Hi, Brady. I'm the worship and creative arts pastor at a church in Georgia. This is Georgia, the state, not the country. The church is going through a bit of a refresh in our visual identity and communication procedures to try to meet the demands of a desire to reach our current congregation and begin interacting with our local community more effectively. Your tips and tutorials have been incredibly helpful in thinking through this process, but I have a few questions that I haven't been able to find resources for. I was hoping you could point me towards something, whether it's a service or an expert, who could help me out here. A sample of some questions I have are... How do you maintain a singular visual identity across all events, series, and initiatives for the church? Should events have a template and a time that they should be designed based on the time of the event itself? Should the departments of a church, like worship or students or missions, be dealt with like individual brands or perhaps closely linked visual, uh, closely linked visual children or all as the same unit? Please help. So the broad rule of thumb here is that you as a church want a branded house, and not a house of brands. Yeah. Alex hit on this already when he talked about 330 kids, 330 youth, right. 
330 groups, that's an example of a branded house where every ministry is part of the family, mm-hmm. the house overall, instead of naming them, you know, uh, community groups and life kids and impact youth and and each one has its own logo mm-hmm. and its own type and its own colors and now you have this house of brands. The analogy that we'll always point to is look at some of the most powerful brands in the world. So look at Apple. They have the uh, iPhone and the iMac and the iPad. And then when they stopped the I, they moved to the Apple blank, the Apple this, mm-hmm. the Apple that. And look at Coke. They got Coke Zero and Diet Coke and Cherry Coke and Coke Spicy. Have you seen this? I have not. I saw this in the is grocery store. I don't know. I don't want to try it. Yeah. If you've tried it, let us know. Yeah. Coke's, so everything is under that layer. Now you might also say, yeah, but they also have Sprite. Right. But this is a conglomerate mm-hmm. of brands. So that's like a different church altogether. Right. But everything is Coke this, Coke this, Coke that. Apple this, Apple this, Apple that. Or before that, I, 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 I. Mm-hmm. That's the branded house that you want, not the house of brands. Follow that principle and everything else will start to neatly fall into place. Right. Last question on this episode. What, if anything, do you recommend including in regard to church doctrinal and belief statements? Do these belong on a website? For context, we are a mid-sized church in the southeastern part of the U.S. We often get questions about our doctrinal beliefs, and we do want to provide an easy access space and level of transparency. However, our heart is to be in relationship with people following Jesus together, even when we disagree on doctrinal positions. So it feels sometimes that like having statements on our website comes across more as standing on issues than walking with people. I love the, I love the way they're talking about this already. Um, and we don't want these to be a barrier to anyone. So what are your thoughts on if doctrinal positions should be prioritized on a website? And if so, how best to approach this? Staff and beliefs pages some of the most trafficked pages on church websites. Mm -hmm. And the reason is people want to know the people that they're getting into faith with. That's right. So I'm going to share this intimate journey of faith with an organization that's led by real people that have real beliefs. Mm -hmm. Are they congruent with my beliefs? And who are these people? Do they look like me? Do they act like me? Do they sound like me? Do they have the same interests as me? It's kind of just, human relationships yeah. 101. And I can certainly empathize with this very well-worded question that says, if we are public about our beliefs mm-hmm. on issues that tend to be polarizing, our concern is that that gets interpreted as us stamping that belief and elevating it above people. Yeah. But people would always come before that belief, right? So if we put those beliefs on the page, aren't we then misaligning our website with the fabric of our church. Right. The other side of that is people want clarity. Mm -hmm. And I have heard so many stories of people that have gone to churches and they've been there for a little while, months, sometimes years, and then they were ready to take a next step and they were blocked. Yeah, they feel like the rug gets pulled out from underneath them because they didn't know that they couldn't participate in A, B, or C, or they didn't know that this, that, and the other because it wasn't clear up in the, I mean, there's a website that, that, there's a website that exists online for this reason called Church Clarity that provides information to folks who are looking for churches to know like, is this church clear about this doctrinal uh, discussion or not? And if they're not, then is this a safe place for you to go? And on these polarizing topics, the way that I've always heard it described is it's okay if you disagree it's okay if this church isn't a like, place where I can belong. Mm-hmm. Please just tell me ahead That's of time. That's right. And I, I just, you know, especially on like the LGBT in that conversation, in yep. that vein, I don't think it's realistic as a church who would not affirm that to believe they can like change people based on what they believe. Right. Like if you, if you are a practicing Christian who says I am gay mm-hmm. or I am within the LGBT, yeah. uh, I want to use the word rainbow, but that's too <laughs> on the nose. Um, Spectrum. That's the one. If you're there, you probably aren't wanting to go to a church to be convinced otherwise. Right. And so like, if you start the relationship with like not being clear, then it can just cause way more heartbreak down the road. Yeah. So I would say in this case, you want to err on not being ambiguous, Mm -hmm. 
and you want to have that level of clarity. If that's congruent with how you function as a community. Correct. Right? And Congruency, and it, again, is that principle. Exactly, exactly. If you're not ready to go there because you're like, no, then it kind of sounds like we're like, you know, we're gay bashing or whatever it might be. And this, and this issue can, or this approach can apply to things beyond this. We're sure. just using that as the example. Um, another option would be having a really open um, invite to be messaged. Mm -hmm. So let's say you don't include that in your doctrinal statements, mm -hmm. right? Because you're like, I don't know, we talk about like the authority of scripture. We talked about like eternal life. We talked sure. about like, you know, it's not in the Nicene Creed either. We just like basically profess the Nicene Creed on our beliefs page and we don't include that because it wasn't included in the Nicene Creed yeah. either. You might then want to have like a banner or a big like link that says, curious about any of our beliefs? Send us an email. We'd love to get back to you with a real, you know, with a real pastor. Yeah, and as we're talking this out, that's literally something I'm going to add to our beliefs page because uh, our... Our um, <laughs> our church is one of those churches that just posts the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed as our as our beliefs. What a cop out! Um, actually, I do have I do have a button here that says, "Do you have a question about what we believe at Life Abundant? Get in touch with one of our pastors by clicking the button below. Ask us anything." But I am as we're talking this out, I'm I'm going to rephrase that after this uh, episode. I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and say like, "See something here? You have a question about? Ask us now." Or are you looking for something that you don't see here? Nice, Love you can that. ask us here uh, because because. This is true. Like this is not a cop out. We I, I say I I say at the top of this page like we're a creedal community. This is true of our community. We these are the majors for us, and they're they're affirmed here in these creeds. But beyond that, what is also true is that there are a lot of minors that are worth talking about. But similar to the question, we our community is intent on walking that out interpersonally and not taking stands on things that are minors that we believe we actually can disagree on. So this is not a cop out for us. This is true. But like you said, having, having a really clear and open invitation to conversation with a visitor before they ever come to visit you, if you're going to take this route, um, is imperative to make sure that people like a are not just wasting their time coming to visit your church. If they're not going to fit in doctrinally, um, or, or B, yeah, just, just want to feel safe in their exploration of faith, whether they're moving to, to your location for the first time or they just left a faith community uh, under whatever circumstances are looking for somewhere else to belong. Um, the, the staff page and the belief page as people who work in church, people who've belonged to a church their entire life, people who build these websites sometimes get overlooked. Um, but when we look at stats of most trafficked church uh, pages on church websites, those two, and for all the reasons you explained, those those two are, are near the top every time, staff and beliefs, because the people who are interacting with church websites, predominantly for the first time, are visitors, and this is their first question. What does this community believe, and who's leading this community? And those are, those are not just valid, those are like, those are very reasonable questions to be asking of a church through their website for the first time. Yeah, and the way you're describing it, and the way the question describes it, is I think it's not naive to believe that there is like these in-between solutions. Uh, you know, I've spoken to um, people that are gay and follow Jesus, and they're like, look, I, it's not that I expect every single person in this church to be affirming, or mm -hmm. even like, you know, the, the leaders to be affirming mm -hmm. necessarily, but it would be good to know, am I allowed to worship here? Mm -hmm. And people know. W it would be good to know, am I allowed to serve here? And if they could tell me yes to one, no to two, mm -hmm. or no to one, no to two, yes to one, yes to two, then it's like, okay, great. I'm not asking every single person, like, you know, roll out the red carpet per se, uh, but can I fit here at all? Yeah. And are there limits to my involvement and how I might fit? Mm -hmm. I mean, for someone like, like, we just came back from South Carolina. And so when I'm in South Carolina, I make an effort to like go worship in a church because. I work in church and serve in church, and it is that is really the only time I have to like hmm. just sit and worship. And so, for someone like me who is a pastor and who's like educated in in theology, like just based off the de denominations that a church identifies with, like it's pretty clear to me what they affirm and what they do not. With the exception of the non-denominational churches, who have some like of which I'm a pastor of one of them, so they have some leniency in like what they can affirm and what they cannot affirm. And so even for me, it's when I'm exploring non-denominational churches online, I'm always going to those belief sections. To there are a few doctrinal things that like would attract me to a church, and a few that would detract me from worshiping in a church, especially with my kids. And so even 
even in, from my perspective, like mm. not, not being like, uh, to the example that you brought up, which is probably the most preeminent, like folks who belong to the Christian queer community, but someone like me, who's just like looking for one or two certain things. It's actually really nice in some cases to see like, for them to spell it out plainly on the beliefs page, like, oh, we believe this about this. I'm like, okay, that gives me information when I'm in South Carolina for one Sunday, what church I'm going to visit. Um, so yeah, there is, there is merit in, in both instances to really spelling it out and saying like, Hey, yeah, this is us. This is our community. We're not ashamed about what we believe or what we don't believe. And this is how we're going to present it on the website. Um, and then there's also, of course, cause I built this website. There's, there's, there's merit to doing it this way, which is like, yep, these are ancient creeds. We can agree on these and every, anything beyond that we're working out in community. If you have a question you want us to answer in a future episode of the Mailbag Bro Church Tools, you can leave it in the comments below on this video, or you can also send us an email directly, hello at prochurchtools.com. And thanks as always for your time, attention, and trust. We will talk to you, if we're not canceled, bye <laughs> next week. You have a feeling about olive oil. Uh, uh, the blue freaking blue. olive oil coffee? That's a crime. Yeah. You agree. Totally. And not, What are they and doing? Not good. Bad. Yeah. Drinking olive yeah. oil. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're on the same page there.